Hey there and welcome back to the channel. We have a beautiful project here on Lake Manitou, Northern Indiana. This house is coming together beautifully. It's gonna be an incredible project. Today in this video, I did an installation of these white oak box beams here behind me. This I get tons of questions about and I took my time and really did a high level step-by-step -step overview on how to install beams like this at an elite level. So I think you guys are gonna find a lot of value in this video. They look absolutely fantastic. They came together really well, and I share my process that I've developed over the years to execute these at a high level quickly and repeatably. So enjoy the video. The best finished carpenters are very intuitive. They know how to pick the best process, the best tools, the best method of assembly for any given circumstance on any given job site condition. So right here, we have a unique situation. We're in a tray that is very shallow. Now, whenever you wanna pick the best way to go about doing something, it's best to start with the end in mind. What do we need to achieve? The first thing we need to do is we need to have very accurate end cuts here. This is stain grade material where these beams meet our drywall. We need to have accurate tight fitting cuts right there. We also need to have the correct length. We need to be fitting tight on both ends of these beams. So that is also going to play into how we go about installing these, whether we pre-assemble these beams or whether we do it piece by piece. We also need to have a very tight fit to the ceiling. So these beams have to be scribed and fit in place so that we're conforming to the ceiling. Again, stain grade, we're not using caulk, we're fitting everything nice and tight. Lastly, whatever method we choose to do these beams, it needs to be fast, and accurate and efficient. It's gotta be cost effective. There are a lot of different ways that you can achieve perfection, but we're production finished carpenters. We have to do it in a time effective way. So the approach that we take is also always gonna be dictated by how much time and effort is required to achieve a good result. As I looked at this job and thought about what my plan of attack was going to be, I had two different options. I could prefabricate these beams and build them as a box beam in the shop, option one, or option two, I could install these beams piece by piece and fit them piece by piece on the job site. Now this was a unique circumstance. I've got 16 total beams to install on this house in trays that are like this. The tray is only about six inches deep and that greatly affected my ability to pre-assemble these beams. Basically on this, my only option to pre-assemble these beams would have worked if I could have cut out a square of drywall, put one end of the beam up into place, lifted the other end, scribed it, bring it down, and then it leaves a hole basically around the edge of the beam that the drywaller comes back and tapes and muds later on. Because of the way this installation is, you'll notice my corner bead is right down here close to the bottom of the beam. There's no way I could have cut that out and left that for the drywaller to try and mud and tape. It would have been a disaster. So our only option here was to fit these beams piece by piece. Our first step is going to be install some blocking for these beams. You can very faintly see my blue chalk line going across here. Yes, they've got their can lights in the wrong place, but we'll go ahead and move our scaffolding over under this next beam section. When you're positioning your scaffolding for the next beam, you just wanna stand directly under where that beam's gonna be and use your center post to side up with that beam. It's gonna work best if you have it perfectly centered. If you watch my videos, you'll notice that all of my scaffolding is what is called double ladder scaffolding. Double ladder scaffolding means it has your ladder rungs on both sides the whole way up. Most typical scaffolding is gonna have rungs on one side and then it's gonna be open on the other side. The reason that I use 
all double ladder scaffolding is because I'm always working on ceilings and I want to be able to adjust the height of my planks on any ladder and I want to be able to position a plank on both sides. Even my, uh, my shorter scaffolding, the yellow scaffolding I use, which is like five foot tall, I had custom welded to have the double ladder installed on it. This stuff I bought from scaffoldexpress.com. It came as double ladder scaffolding, um, but I believe at the time when I was looking for double ladder scaffolding, I couldn't find any in the five foot length. So that's part of the, the method here. Part of working efficiently on ceilings is having a good scaffolding setup. Now I take a lot of heat from people because whenever I'm working up on ceilings, uh, I'll be 25 feet up in the air and I still just use two planks like this and have a space in the center. There's a couple reasons for just using two planks. One is simply because whenever you put planks on any of these intermediate bars, you can't have three planks going all the way across because of this center bar. So any adjustment that you have in here, you're only gonna get two planks. Because of that, and basically, so on your top bar, that's the only place where you can actually put three planks across continuously. So over the years, I've just gotten very used to working on two planks. It's second nature to me walking back and forth. Some people say, well, man, I'd fall right through that crack. The reality is I would have to try really hard to actually fall through this. If I lost my footing, I would easily be able to grab myself with my arms. Uh, it's not that big a deal. Like I said, after you've done it for so many years, it's just second nature to walk around on top of it like this. The other thing is whenever you're working up really high, it's actually nice to be able to climb up and down between the planks rather than having to climb all the way up on the outside of the scaffolding and go over the edge. I fit between these pretty nicely. So I get a lot of comments about safety. There is a reason why I do the things I do. This works really well for me. Getting started installing our blocking here, the first thing that I want to do, I shouldn't, is I want to locate my, uh, my blocking that's actually been pre-installed Look at that, I actually have a joist going through here on this particular spot. We had blocking pre-installed on this whole ceiling, <clears throat> but it looks like, there's one, so it looks like I got one right here. One right here. And I missed one over here for some reason. Anytime you're trying to locate blocking, but you're not 100% sure on what you're picking up, I always carry these little finish nails uh, in my tool belt. That way you can just tap that up in there and ensure that you're hitting something positive as over here. I thought I had something. And when it goes straight up, you know you don't actually have blocking there. But then over here, nothing again. We do have a joist going all the way along here. I came over here. I got solid blocking. So it's just a matter of uh, trying to find it with your stud finder and then testing once you pick up something. We'll go ahead and nail up our blocking with our framing nailer here. These were super heavy beams. Uh, I'd add maybe some GRK screws as well, but given that these aren't super heavy. I'm fine scissor nailing. Some framing nails in there.
One of the most important pieces of blocking to install is a little piece at the end of the beams. This is gonna help keep our side beams plumb whenever we go to put them into position. If you don't have this little piece of blocking on the end, your side beams can want to tilt and it's a lot harder to get an accurate scribe. It also helps keep the beams square later on when we assemble them. When I'm doing beams, I like to always use uh, finger jointed poplar material as my blocking material. It's much straighter, it's got a much crisper edge than framing material and just in general, it's easier to work with. Another small thing but important thing that I like to always try to do is if I'm using interior blocking that's one by six material, that's five and a half inches wide, I'll strategically make my beam width seven inches wide. Five and a half plus three quarter on both sides equals seven inches. And that gives you a little bit of room with a one by eight to rip a little extra off of both ends if it's, the board isn't perfectly straight and net a seven inch wide beam. So that's a tip. Whatever your blocking material is gonna be, design your beam width around that. It saves you work not having to rip down all of your blocking material to a specific width. Okay, we've got our blocking installed. Now it's time to start installing our side pieces. To do that, we need to know two things. We need to know the length, and we also need to have the angle cut for the ends. No, they're not gonna be square. They're not gonna be square. Sorry for the noise in the background. We've got a lot of stuff going on on this job site. So they're not gonna be square. Where do we wanna take our measurement from? We could take our measurement from the top of the beam or from the bottom. It makes way more sense to take your measurement from the bottom of the beam. I'll explain why and it'll make more sense in a little bit. So we're just gonna to wanna to go to about where the bottom of the beam is gonna be go to the center of the beam and then carefully shoot your measurement with your laser. I shoot it three times. Here I shot it all three times and I got the exact same measurement all three times. That's a good sign. I got 139 and 7 16 So I'm gonna write that down and now I'm gonna move on to figuring out what my angle cuts are gonna be. Notice that it's very important where I take my measurement from because of the corner bead that's on this drywall. There's a big angle going on here. So here I've got 139 and 7 16 three times. If I move down and take my measurement on top of this corner bead, watch what happens. I'm gonna shoot it a little lower. I lost an eighth of an inch right there. There I've got 139 and 5 /16. So it's very important that you shoot from the exact position where the bottom of your beam is gonna be. So we've got our length measurement, but if you've done carpentry for very long, you know that you can't just cut things square and have them fit. Here we've got a drywall corner bead, which is typically always gonna make the mud build out so that this area is gonna be way out of plumb, it's gonna be tilted in. I've already done these four other beams and I had one spot that was almost a quarter inch out of plumb. So how in the world are we gonna get the correct angle on the end of these beams? The answer is you always use a torpedo level. Um, one of my most used tools when doing beams is a torpedo level. It's a must have for gauging angles. The other tool that we're gonna be using here is a little pipe gauge here. And you see this has got number measurements written on it. This is super handy for gauging angles. Whenever you use this pipe gauge in combination with a torpedo level, it works great. I'll link this in the video description. To get our angle, we're gonna take our torpedo level, stick it up here and find about where plumb is. Here on this one, I'm actually really, really close to plumb, which is surprising. Um, as you can see, I've got actually a little bit of curve in the drywall, um, but I might add, let me see here, I'll add a 16th to the top of that cut. I'm gonna go ahead over here, I'm gonna check this side as well. Stick my level on there. 
and about a sixteenth as well. So my baseline measurement is down here. I'll just mark plus a sixteenth up here. Now let's go over here and do the other side. This one's not nearly as good. As you can see, I'm, I'm way off right there. Take my angle gauge again. I'm gonna put it on the eighth mark. See how that looks in terms of plumb. Looks like it needs a little more actually. Let me try 530 seconds. Nope, too much. So I'm gonna add an eight to the top of this cut. I've actually got the material for my side beams stage down here. I'm not sure if I mentioned it yet, but I actually had this material delivered to my shop and I actually ran this through the power feeder um, on my shop table saw and put a 46 degree miter on it already. So this is ready to go, all beveled. I just need to cut the ends and put it up in place. For cutting to length, if I was near my miter saw, I would just use it. I'm down in the basement away from my miter saw, so I'm using my trusty HKC 55. This is a fantastic tool. I use it all the time. Comes in super handy when you wanna cut things but you aren't near a miter saw. Getting started here, I'm gonna make my cut on my first end. This is the bottom of my beam right here. And I'm just gonna draw a square line all the way across this. Nice and square. Now I knew on this end I needed to add a 16th. So I'm gonna mark an additional 16th right here and I'll connect the dots this end to this end and cut it at that angle. The great thing about the HKC is it's very easy to connect dots like this. So I'll just line up my splinter guard here on the top and my splinter guard down here on the bottom. And I can make this cut. Here you can see my pencil line right there. We're gonna sand this in a little bit so it's no big deal. But if I put my square up here, you'll notice I've got an additional 16th of material up at the top, so it's cut at the correct angle. I will also note, I am cutting, you can see it, at about a six degree angle. So this cut is angled in about six degrees. That's gonna make it easier to fit these pieces in place nice and tight. If you remember, our measurement was 139 and 7 sixteenths. So I'm pulling my measurement off of the bottom edge where the bevel is. I'm gonna hook on there. 139 and 7 sixteenths. If anything, I wanna be a little bit under this measurement. I do not wanna be over. Otherwise, I'm gonna be fighting this piece to install it. Here we are, 139 and 7 sixteenths. I might be a little bit strong on that. I don't wanna be, so about right there. Now, on this end, we needed to add an eighth or maybe a strong eighth. So I'm gonna very carefully square up from that mark. And I'm going to add an eighth. So right there, so now we'll connect the dots from top edge down to bottom edge. You can see our square line. This is cut out of plumb, so it should fit pretty good. We've got our side beams cut to length, and it's time to start scribing these in place. There's something very important that we need to pay attention to before we start this process. You'll notice I've already got these four other beams fit in place, and a very important detail is that on the bottom of all of these beams, they're exactly the same distance from the bottom of the beam to the corner bead. That's a critical detail. We don't wanna be fitting these beams in place and have one beam a half inch from the corner beam, the corner bead, and then the next beam an inch up from the corner bead. That would look like crap. 
So our baseline to start scribing these all needs to be the same, and that baseline has to be derived from this corner bead. That way when these are all fit in place, we've got the exact same space under each beam between the beam and the corner bead. You might not be able to see it when the beam is further down, but right here, you'll notice these pencil lines under the beams. That's a half inch from that pencil line to the corner bead right here. If we come down here, you'll see the exact same thing. That is our baseline where we're gonna start our scribe. Hopefully I can pick this up with the GoPro. We're gonna use our level, get it over here on the edge, and we're gonna sight and see where it's plumb. This is almost plumb actually. The drywall has actually got a little bit of a curve in it from the mud drying. Um, but let me take my gauge here. I'm gonna put it on a 16th. And as you can see, that's pretty close to plumb. So I am gonna mark it. I'm gonna put plus a 16th on this side. What I'm gonna do here is use a gauge block that is a half inch thick to mark a half inch up from the corner bead. Then I'm gonna use my torpedo level and level across on both sides of the beam. And then that gives us a nice baseline to start from. We'll align our side beams with that pencil line on both ends. I use GRK cabinet head screws to tack the beams up in place for scribing. I'll put a screw in the center and then on both ends to hold it in place. When we tack these in place, we'll be aligning the bottom edge of the beam with our pencil line right here, and then we'll be scribing about 3 eighths of an inch off the top, and that'll lift it up 3 eighths, which you'll notice there, the beam finishes out about 3 eighths above that pencil line. We'll grab our drill, and this is where careful measuring really pays off. We wanna to try to do this with as much as minimal drywall damage as possible. And you remember we put that about seven degree bevel on the end, that's really gonna help it slide into place right now. So that's just about a perfect fit from what I can, eh, maybe not quite perfect, it might be a hair long. But I can see down here, I'm aligned nicely with my pencil line. So I'm gonna go ahead and tack this. Now I'll move over here to my other end. One nice thing is if you do get the fit tight enough, it'll hold itself up in place. I may shave a little bit off the end. I mean, it fits, it's nice and tight. We don't have any gaps, but it, it does damage the drywall just a little bit, which some of that's to be expected. That looks pretty good right there. So now I'll tack this end. I'm gonna leave the center um, loose for now. Come over here to the other end or the other board. We'll do the same thing. I'm gonna set this end in place, try and get it on the pencil line. And I'll rock this other end in. Um, when your board is a little bit long, flex it out in the center. That'll reduce the length and allow you to get it positioned and then snap it in place. So I'm right on my pencil line over here. Go ahead and tack that. A little low over here. Sometimes I do like to use my torpedo level just to check it, see how it looks. Looks like it needs to come down a hair. I'm gonna use my pry bar to just micro adjust it. That should be right on the money. Now before I tack the center, I'll come back in the center and use my torpedo level because a lot of times the boards will have a crown in them one way or the other. And so I can see I need to push this one up a little bit. Ch 
check it again. That's about perfect. Always remember when you're working with white oak that's got a miter on it, you're basically working with a heavy guillotine right above your head. So you always wanna make sure it's firmly tacked in place and you don't let your guard down because if it fell on your neck or something, it would uh, lay you open. So here, let's take a little bit closer look. See my pencil lines and you'll notice that the bottom of the beam is right on those pencil lines. Also notice my end cuts. They fit very nice and tight to the drywall on both ends. So I've been fitting beams for almost a decade and I can tell you that this torpedo level method is the best way that I know of to get beams to fit really well. You just simply use plumb as a reference line and then you note whatever you need to add or subtract from one end of the cut and you can get perfect angles every time. With these GRK screws, all I do is just lightly tack them. You'll see the space behind the washer there. You don't wanna drive them in, otherwise it'll leave a big indentation right there. So now we're ready to start scribing our beams <clears throat> and the million dollar question, what scribing tool to use? You've often probably seen me use tape for scribing. Uh, we would have taped the top edge of the beam prior to putting up putting it up if we were gonna use tape, and then we would use either the razor scribe here or a hawk knife like you see here. We're not gonna use either of those today. Um, could use uh, this easy scribe. Actually, I don't know what this is called. This is a pen scribing tool here. Not gonna use that. Works great for scribing baseboard. You probably saw that recently on the baseboard video. Um, this scribing tool I carry on my tool belt at all times. This is a great tool, it's adjustable, but I don't want adjustable. In this case, I want to keep the exact same offset distance on every beam. So I don't really wanna use this one. That leaves me with my preferred scribing tool, a block of wood and a pencil. All right, here we go. The truth is all you need is a block of wood and a pencil we're just offsetting all these beams the exact same distance. So using a block of wood, we don't have to worry about our, you know, easy scribe moving or something like that on us. It's gonna stay nice and consistent. It's cheap, it's reusable, it's readily available on every job site. So sometimes when you need to scribe, just grab a, grab a block of wood and it'll work just fine. If I need absolute perfection when scribing, I'll use tape and then a razor scribe of some kind. But in this case, we're scribing beams to the ceiling. It's extra labor and extra cost with consumables taping every single beam. I just don't think it's necessary for something like this. I can see my pencil line just fine um, and this works perfectly well. So that's why I'm not using tape here. It's just a little bit overkill for this type of situation. I've got 18 of these beams to do. That's a ton of tape, ton of pulling off tape. It's just not worth it to me. Scribing with a block and pencil is pretty easy. The key is to have just the right amount of pressure. I'm actually making it look way harder than it is here. I'm breaking my pencil let off way too much. Um, you wanna have just the right amount of pressure on the block and the pencil, and it'll glide right along the ceiling and the wood really nicely. You wanna make sure that you have enough of a pencil line that you can easily see it whenever we're gonna cut uh, the scribe on the table saw in a little bit. Don't make it too light. Now that we've got our scribe line marked, we can go ahead and bring these pieces down and cut our scribe line. I'm gonna take the screws out of the ends first, then I'll come back get in the center, make sure I've got a firm hold on the board so that it doesn't fall. This is pressure fit so it's not going anywhere. Take out my screw. Again, I always try to keep one hand on it just in case, just to make sure that it's not gonna fall and damage the workpiece or damage me. Pop one end out. 
And this is really easy to do. It's very uh, systematic. So many times it just becomes second nature. The next question is, what is the best method for cutting to our scribe line? To answer that question, we've got to ask what tools are available to us, what tools are near us, what is the most accurate method that we have, what is the most pleasant method, what is the most safe method? So for me, whenever I'm scribing beams, a lot of times I'll just use a regular circular saw set on a bevel, and then I'll use a block plane to clean up the edge. In this instance, my table saw is right up here. We've got a nice outfeed on it. I've also got a dust extractor hooked up to the table saw, and it is just very accurate and very pleasant to cut a scribe line on the table saw. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can achieve a nice cut. I mean, you could use a planer, but that would take forever because you're rem removing a bunch of material. Um, you could use a jigsaw. Again, not a good tool to use because it's just too slow. Um, so my default is usually either circular saw and block plane or table saw. To cut a scribe accurately on the table saw, we want to go ahead and bump our bevel over to about seven degrees or so. That way, if we don't hit our pencil line perfectly, we can clean up that edge really quickly with a block plane or sander later. You want to have a good outfeed support as well as an infeed support if you've got one. That'll help you keep control of the workpiece a little bit better. You want to look at the right side of your blade and you want to cut your pencil line with that right side of the blade. Keep all your focus on the right side of the blade and just slowly feed it through splitting that pencil line as you go. If you leave just a little bit of pencil line, don't worry about it we can sand that off in a little bit. After I've got my scribe cut on the table saw, I'll plop it on my miter saw wings and give it a quick sanding. Before I sand the face of the material, I wanna look at that cut, that scribe cut edge real quick. If I see any areas with pencil line, I'll go ahead and hit that with the sander really quick. That way we've got a perfect scribe. So we brought our pieces up from the basement to our table saw. We ripped our scribes here. Now I've got my scribed pieces sitting over here on my miter saw. Next thing I'm gonna do is sand these. Before I sand them, I wanna take a look and you'll see like right here, I've got some pencil line here. I wanna go ahead and just remove that. I mean, it's really close, but I'll go ahead and remove all of that pencil line so it's as perfect as possible. You've got a couple options. You can use a block plane, just hit it real quick. Since we've got a bevel on it, you're not removing much material. It's pretty easy to do that. Because white, we've got white oak here, depending on which way the grain's going, sometimes it can want to grab with the block plane a little bit. Yesterday when I installed the other four beams, I was just using my sander. So before I go ahead and sand the face of the material, I'll just turn the sander over like this and I'll remove any of that pencil line uh, before I sand the face. All right, our side pieces are sanded, so I'm gonna take these back down to the basement and then I'm gonna cut my bottom piece and we'll be ready to put this thing together. I've got my material for the bottoms of the beams right here. Again, I ran this all through the table saw at my shop with the power feeder, so the quality on the miters is absolutely excellent. 
All I've got to do is cut this to length and sand it, and we'll take it back downstairs. Now to cut this bottom piece, we're gonna cut it off square first, and then we're gonna bevel it. So now I'm gonna knock it over to about a 10 or 15 degree bevel. And I don't want this bevel to come all the way to the top edge. I want it to start about a 16th or an eighth inch down from the face. This is one of those really important little details. So why not just start with it at 10 degrees and cut, cut the bevel that way? Why make it to an additional step? Well, if you're cutting a bevel and your workpiece is not perfectly flat, it will cut at an angle and you won't have a square cut. If I'm at zero and my workpiece is not perfectly flat on the table, it's still gonna cut at zero. So that's why we cut at zero degrees first and then we'll move over to our bevel and we'll cut that and we'll make it so that that cut starts about an eighth inch down below the surface. And then that bevel will allow the piece to slide up into place a lot easier. Another key thing to talk about right now is you remember at the beginning of the video, we talked about where do you measure your beam length from? Because we measured our beam length from the bottom of the beam rather than the top, we can cut this piece exactly to that measurement uh, and we know exactly what that measurement is gonna be. If we start our cut process from the top edge of the beam, it screws everything up and makes it a lot more difficult. So take your, be your measurements from the bottom of the beam. Here you can see that bevel cut actually starts about right here where it angles in. So we've got a nice square edge for that top eighth inch, maybe quarter inch, and then from here it angles in, which will make it slide up into place easier. We'll also go ahead and get this piece sanded up as well. gonna rant a little bit real quick. To me, one of the saddest things is whenever homeowners and builders pay for expensive materials like this white oak, and then carpenters don't sand it to prep it for stain. This material, white oak, it's so expensive, it's a tra tragedy to me that it would be installed without a good sanding before, before we put it up. It comes from the mill pretty good, but there's still always chatter, scratches, dirt, etc. Give the material a good sand. It'll stain up so much better, and it, does, it just does the material justice. Um, it's just a shame to install expensive, beautiful material like this and not sand it first. Festool ETS EC150 five millimeter stroke with a vacuum must have tool, it sits by my miter saw all the time. Um, I think sanding is just an essential part of this business that often goes by the wayside. All right, we are on to installing the side beams. At this point, this is one of the easiest steps of the whole process because we've already fit them. We know that they fit. It's just a matter of pushing them up into place against the ceiling and uh, nailing it off. So go ahead, get one end in there, push this other end in. Um, here it doesn't matter if you want to start on the end or in the center. The most important thing is just that it's pushed up tight against the ceiling.
I actually got just a little bit ahead of myself and on this end, my, uh, my end was actually not all the way up against the blocking. That's better. Okay, ready to install the bottom. Sides are in place. Got the bottom here. This is our most important tool. Whenever you're installing beams piece by piece like this overhead, this is, I mean, this tool is worth its weight in gold. Um, the problem you have with most blue bottles is that whenever they're partially empty, you have to tilt them like this in order to get glue to come out. So if you're trying to glue something overhead, squeezing the bottle does not work very well. This bottle is designed so that it's got a tube right here that goes all the way down to the bottom. So you can have this perfectly vertically and squeeze it and glue will come out the top. So this works excellent for working overhead gluing miters. So we've got our glue bot. One of the most underrated skills in carpentry is getting just the right amount of glue on a miter. So it does take a lot of experience to get just the right amount, but what we really want here is very, very minimal glue squeeze out. We want to have good coverage of glue all the way across the glue joint, but we don't want to have a bunch of glue squeezing out all over the place that we have to clean up. Now, you'll see some people using like a brush on their glue joints. I would never do that. Your finger is the best thing for a glue joint because you can control the thickness of glue that's going on that joint with your finger. Like there, I had too much glue. I can feel that, I can sense that, I can wipe it off and get it off the joint. So now that's not gonna squeeze out. I can apply just the right amount of pressure to get a nice even layer of coverage. And I also wanna make sure that I'm getting glue at the very tip of that miter. That's gonna help later whenever we sand it. It's gonna sand and be completely invisible afterwards. So, this is a little bit of uh, art, a little bit of science, a little bit of experience, but try and put the right amount of glue that you're gonna need. Even the way you hold the glue bottle right there, I'm not holding it right, so it's, it was falling off. If I've got it angled too much like this, it's not spreading. You wanna get coverage so that it goes across there. Now, if I put that on and my bead was a little bit too thick, I'm gonna be able to feel that with my finger as I push and pull it across. And you can see that excess glue start to accumulate. Just wipe it off somewhere else. You don't want all that on your joint or it's gonna, you're gonna to have to clean it up on the outside of the miter and it's gonna be a huge pain. So it's a very underrated skill, but we wanna get just the right amount of glue. So we've got a strong miter, a wet glue joint on both sides but not too much. It's very important whenever you're doing a beam like this that you glue both sides of the miter. You want both of them to be wet with glue. Um, for sure, if you have one side dry, it's gonna seriously compromise the strength of that glue joint. You wanna have glue on both sides. And again, we'll do the same thing. Use your finger. You can see I'm even like diverting the excess glue up and away. Your finger is the best tool for spreading glue. I'll take it to my grave. And again, I want that very tip of that miter to have some glue on it because whenever we sand it, our sawdust is gonna mix with that glue and the tip of that miter and it's gonna make that joint absolutely invisible. Okay, it's time to put our bottom piece in place. We don't wanna let that glue have too much time to tack up. 
So this part's a little bit tricky. If, you're, if your cut is a little bit too long, it can be a nightmare to get this in place. Um, I've got that drywall corner bead there to contend with, so I gotta get a sense for if this is going to pop into place or not. Remember, if we spring this down, it reduces the length of the board and will help allow it to pop up into place. I've got this one a little bit too long. So there you saw how I sprung that down to reduce the length of the board. And now we can get it positioned a little bit better. The biggest mistake that you could make right there is nailing the bottom of your beam in the center before you've got both ends of that corner bead. Because if you do that, it wouldn't have went in place and it would have destroyed that corner bead trying to force it up into place. So I like to just tack the center now that I've got both ends up in place. I didn't do a great job of getting this one positioned. So it's fighting me a little bit more than normal. If your miter needs a line, the rubber mallet is your best friend. So I'll go ahead, get that center tacked, and I'll come down to my ends and get those positioned a little bit better. Like I said, I just, uh, I didn't do a great job of getting this one positioned this time. So now my ends are tacked in place and I want to go along and nail this. So we're gonna nail from both edges, both faces I should say, with the pin nailer. Now if you notice that the corner is proud in a certain direction, use your rubber mallet to bring everything into alignment and then nail it off. So it's just a matter of working your way down the miter. If you notice that you have nails that are hooking out like that, change the direction of your nailer and usually that'll solve the problem. So again, I'm a, it's fighting me a little bit. It's wanting to stay a little bit low here. Just keep using that rubber mallet to bring it into a line. The other absolutely crucial tool that you want to have anytime you start fitting the miter on a beam is a clamp. There's sometimes it's just going to fight you and the beam or a clamp will help pull it to where it needs to be. I didn't really need it that bad in this case, but I wanted to demonstrate it because it is absolutely essential to have one hand before you start fitting a beam. Don't go running after it while you've got wet glue. Always have that before you even start working your mic. After you've got your miter nailed, any glue squeeze out that you've got, 
try and just wipe it off, get the majority of it off while it's still wet before it starts to tack up. The biggest thing that will cause you to have to waste labor sanding is excess glue everywhere. So you do not want to have a bunch of excess glue. This looks uh, pretty good in my opinion. Now the next step, while our glue is still wet, we just got done nailing it, we can burnish it if we want. Now, because I ripped these miters on the table saw, the miter quality is so good that I really don't even need to burnish it. So I'm gonna put that away. All I'm gonna do is take a piece of 120 sandpaper, sand one face like this, go along, Make sure you see all that glue coming off and then switch to the other side and look at that joint just absolutely disappear. If there's even a little bit of a gap, your sawdust will mix with the glue and it'll fill that crack and it'll absolutely disappear. So you can see just work the length of this whole thing and the miter looks perfect. Very, very minimal effort sanding. All right, this side is all done. Silky smooth. Come over here to the other side. You gotta watch out for these guys. Jam your hand into one of these pin nails that's sticking out and uh, you'll regret it. Just bend them back and forth to break those off. And we'll do the same thing. Work your way down the miter, make sure all that glue is coming off, then do the opposite side. And look how crispy it is. We're just slightly easing the edge on this, but for the most part, it's very square. It just looks great. Something I wanna to touch on quick is uh, thoughts on pin nailers. So first off, you'll notice I did not have my Milwaukee M12 cordless pin nailer out doing this. The reason for that is, you notice I was shooting a lot of pins. Those cordless pin nailers have a very limited, I shouldn't say it's a very limited shelf life, but they're only gonna shoot so many pins before they need replaced. And I don't wanna wear it out prematurely shooting tons and tons of pins on beams like this. The other thing is air will set pins a lot better than a cordless nailer, even though the Milwaukee M12 does great. Um, air just really sets them nicely. I like this Senko nailer. Uh, it's been good to me. It'll shoot up to two inch nails. My preferred pin nail, 23 gauge, um, is inch and 3 16 That's what I use 90% of the time that I'm shooting pins. So that works really well. So the other thing is these beams are like maybe nine or 10 feet off of the floor and you absolutely cannot see any of the pin nail holes with your eye. Now, if we get up here, you'll notice I was shooting pins about every eight inches or so. Eight, eight to 10 inches is about what it takes to, to really tie these miters together. So that's what I recommend. Now, most of the time when I'm doing beams, it's almost always stain grade beams. So whenever the painter comes back through and wipes a stain on this, those micro pin holes, they fill up with stain and you absolutely cannot tell that they're there. So I have no problem using pin nail holes on beams like this and having those quote unquote exposed fastener holes. It's not a big deal because you can't see them. I was talking to one of my good buddies, uh, carpenter buddies on Instagram last night who does a lot of beams and he uses tape and will go along and tape all of his miters so that he's got tape probably every 12 inches or so pulling that miter together and doesn't use nails. Um, kind of like I said, I feel like the pin nails, you can't see them, just use pin nails and the advantage of using the pin nails over using tape like this is if I use this tape, I've got to go back later. I've got to pull all of this off and I can't sand 
and finish my, my miter while that glue's wet, uh, I would be sanding over the top of the tape and stuff like that. So it's just more of a hassle. I don't wanna have to go back and pull these pieces of tape off later. And I also want to be able to work my miter, sand it and get it finished right now and move on to the next thing and not have to worry about coming back to finish it later. So that's kind of my philosophy on the pins versus tape thing in this application. So I talked about at the beginning of the video, whenever we choose our process and technique to do something, start with the end in mind. The end in mind was first off, we needed to have our ends fit perfectly. They do go over here. So that process is excellent. We needed to have the top of our board fit nice and tight to the ceiling. As you can see, we achieved that. Looks really good. We needed to have a miter that looks excellent the whole way up and down. As you can see, that looks really good. And lastly, we need to have a method that is fast, efficient, uh, easy to do, not overly strenuous, and just generally productive and conducive to high quality work and profitability. So I haven't done a ton of beams in my career. This is the process that I'm using right now at this point. I think it works really good. Hope this has helped you out. I'm really happy with how the whole product is turning out. I've got two more beams to go. This next one, I might just let the GoPro rip and do like a first person view of the whole process. But either way, hopefully you guys have enjoyed this video. Hopefully it's been really helpful. It's made my day exceptionally unproductive, but uh, I'm happy to help, help out. So give it a thumbs up. If you liked it, drop a comment. Check out those affiliate links to the tools in the video description. All that good stuff, I'll link there, and I get a good kickback whenever you go and purchase those. So appreciate a lot that a lot. We'll see you on the next video.